Yes, OK, good. So um, first, let me ask you a question. How many people feel that they would be able to explain why it is that when you look at the Parton distribution functions, and here's the up quark, it has, you know, it exceeds everything else up, up, up here. Here's the anti-up quark. And then the gluons dominate at small x. Why? What's the basic reason? How many people feel they could explain that? Okay. I asked you if you felt you could explain it. I didn't ask you to explain it. I just asked you if you felt you could. So, so people are not confident that they can, because the hands don't go flying up, right? So, so it's better that, so it's good that I'm going through this. It, it's simple enough. Um, all right. So um, the other thing I want to do before I start, uh, because it will come back, is make sure that, that, I mean, there's a possible confusion in the language, and Jason did explain it, but it, it wasn't at a point where it was, you know, well, it's so important today, I want to make sure that the, the language is clear. There are three different types of things called showers, and they're very different. Um, there are, the two which are, that involve a detector involve the electromagnetic shower of an electron or a photon as it passes through matter, where through Bremsstrahlung it spits off a photon, or a pair production where the photon splits to an electron-positron pair, you get this cascade where all the energy of the thing that's coming in gets turned into a very large number of electrons and photons and positrons. And then you collect that energy in those details Jason explained. A hadronic shower would be where a hadronic particle, charged or neutral, plows into material and starts hitting nuclei. The nuclei break apart, and pines get created, and those hit nuclei, and those break apart, and there's a whole bunch of junk that goes flying out. And you collect all of that in a detector. And the important thing is that these are hadrons or electrons or photons, and they're all real particles. They're on shell. We are going to talk about a parton shower. This is something else. This is something that occurs in the vacuum. There's no matter around. It has nothing to do with hitting anything. The point is, I mean, how, how could that be? Right? You start with one particle, you end up with many. The point is the particle we're starting with isn't on shell if we're talking about a final state shower. And for what I'm about to do now with partner distribution functions, it's the other way around. This guy's on shell, but this guy isn't. Right? This one's on its way into having a collision. This one is on its way out of a collision. And it's precisely that dynamics that we're going to be studying today. Okay. And the first thing we're going to do is talk about the running of the parton distribution functions, the fact that they're not actually constant, and that there's not, therefore, you know, completely fixed in terms of what you mean by them. You have to actually talk about factorization, how you do it. I won't actually talk about factorization much, but at least uh, say something about where it comes in. And that will be the case where we start with a particle that's in the proton, basically on shell, and is on its way into a collision. And you can neglect the part out here. Uh, for a parton shower in the final state, which I'll come to later in the, the, the talk, the point will be you start with something off shell. You end up with a shower of particles, which are gluons and quarks and antiquarks, that have to turn into hadrons somehow. And the point that I emphasized yesterday is that even though this thing in the middle is very complicated non-perturbative physics, it doesn't change very much in terms of where the particles go. It doesn't actually affect the quarks and gluons very much. It doesn't affect their momentum. Essentially, whatever you build up here is going to just go right through here. And the hadrons are going to represent what happened here. And that's the real sophisticated meaning of parton-hadron duality is that we'll calculate all this complicated partonic dynamics, which is perturbative. And then the hadrons will go where these partons went. And we can calculate this part. Even though we can't calculate the transition, it doesn't matter to the, well, to a small degree. I mean, to, I mean, I mean sorry, it doesn't matter very much. It matters you know, at the 1 GeV level on a 100 GeV jet. Okay. So that will all get explained again if it wasn't clear the first time. Now. Uh, let me first start by uh, explaining why it was that I could do what I did in the second lecture, which show you the parton distribution functions and not uh, specify what scale I was actually talking about them. So here are plots, which are maybe easier to see on your, uh, on your paper. That's a little hard to say. But what is shown here is one parton distribution function. In this case, it is the up quark distribution function. And of course, it, as I did before, what's plotted there is not f of x, but x squared times f of x. But what you can see is that here, there are three different scales involved. So these would be appropriate for processes at 100 GeV, or 300 GeV, or 1,000 GeV. And you can see that, yeah, there are differences at the 10% level. And if you're doing precision measurements, that's important. So for example, if you're trying to do a very tricky measurement, and you have to subtract backgrounds very carefully, and you need to know those backgrounds, you better be very careful about this. On the other hand, if you're 
looking for some rather crude uh, signature, like some very large resonance and so forth, you may not care very much about this. And in any case, the plots that I showed you, which were on log plots, wouldn't have changed very much. Yes, it's a new shower. Sorry, this will just take a Now, the, the other two plots show the same thing, but for the gluon and for the, um, uh, no, for the anti-up quark and for the gluon. Right, up, anti-up, and whoops. Yeah, sorry, the, fir yeah, the first one's gluon, the second one's up, and the third one's anti-up. You see, again, the changes are not very big. So now we can turn off the, the uh, that's all we need for, for, for now. Question, so yeah. this is the running of the CDF, and does it depend on scheme? Uh, it, there, it depends on all sorts of things. So yeah, you gotta you gotta be careful. But I mean, you know, again, how big is the scheme dependent? It's not gonna be big in the running. I mean, it's it's it's, it's we're, we're not talking about a situation where a person who's just trying to get a rough feel for how the how the machine works needs to worry about that. And that's why I didn't worry about it. Nonetheless, it is important, and because the the, the mathematics of it, which is easier to understand and more familiar to you, because uh, you saw it in class, is related to the physics of jets, I want to cover it. Okay, it's actually very similar physics, just in different kind of uh, kinematics. Okay, so here I am, for most of you, at least reviewing something that have, you haven't looked at in three years since your first quantum field theory class, and you've forgotten it all. But you'll, you'll, you'll recognize pieces of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a quark. We could take a gluon, but let's take a quark inside a proton. And initially, um, this quark carries a fraction x of the proton's momentum, so it's energy E naught is x times the proton energy. And I'll call its momentum p mu. And it's going to split. This is a virtual process into a gluon and a quark. Now, it's going to do that because we're imagining that somewhere a little further down here, it's actually going to have a collision with something. Now, um, I'm going to uh, so ignore, the, ignore the other terms here, just, just the fact that I've called these k and q. The point here is that since this is the particle which is, undergo, which is going to undergo the collision, this guy can be off shell. This guy and this guy are almost on shell. So p squared and k squared are much less than q squared, which means that uh, q squared is approximately minus 2p dot k. Um, now, uh, and also q squared uh, is, um, is negative here. So minus 1 over q squared, um, sorry, let me, let me just catch up with my notes here. Yeah, there's a couple things I want to say first. I'm sorry, I forgot. Um, before I do that, so let's imagine this quark as it's heading in towards a, a collision with another quark, let's say, and stuff's going to come out. And there's some characteristic energy scale, capital Q, um, you know, I see in my notes I have an ambiguity in terms of what I called Q. Uh, let me use a different symbol. Let's see. How about... What's your favorite letter other than P, Q, and, and K? All right. I, I think I'm just going to use E. Okay, so, so root S. Is what we're going to use. Okay. So there's some typical energy, uh, root S hat. Okay, so there's some energy scale here. And what's going on as this quark is, is heading on it, towards its collision is the following. First of all, that. This is an ordinary quantum particle. It has interactions. So of course, it's emitting gluons and reabsorbing gluons all the time. And some of them are very high energy gluons, and it, re emits, and it reabsorbs them right away. And some of them are very soft low energy gluons, and they get reabsorbed. Uh, and some of them are actually not so low energy, but they're basically on shell, so they can live a long time. And they're, all this stuff is going on. And then, whoops, the collision happened. And some poor guy got left out. Before he got reabsorbed, the quark went somewhere else. It even disappeared. Right. So it's inevitable that this happens. I mean, this happens with electrons and photons, right? This is nothing. There's nothing special about quarks and gluons. This is interacting field theory. Just thought about it the correct way. Now, again, these virtual processes are occurring for all sorts of off-shellnesses of the quark. 
Right? Some of these kick the off shell, the, the, the quark way off shell. Some of them just kick it off shell a little bit. Um, the whole system, of course, is remaining on shell uh, until just before the collision, if you like. Now, their off shellness, of course, is associated with times and distance scales. If you're off shell by an amount of order e, there, the time scale associated with that is one over e, and distance scales are typically one over e as well. So, um, what is happening here is that if you have a process that occurs at this energy scale, it occurs with the time, which is the inverse of that, and the distance, which is an inverse of that. And so you expect that those gluons that were emitted that would have been absorbed on longer time scales, and thus of lower off-shellness, or associated with a lower off-shell quark, I should say, are the ones that will not be reabsorbed. And there'll be lots of them. There'll be this one, and there'll be one back here that was just a little bit off-shell. It won't get reabsorbed either. Maybe even one way back here that was going to be, you know, these things were going to be reabsorbed a full 10 to the minus 24 seconds later. But this only took 10 to the minus 27 seconds, so, you know, it's lost. Okay? So, um, now, again, these particles which don't get reabsorbed, they're, they're real. They become real. They're, they're, they must be. Right? There's no place to be reabsorbed. They're real particles. They're on shell. Um, or on shell enough that, uh, at best, they'll do what we'll describe later in a final state part on shell. Um, now, all of this stuff is called initial state radiation in general. Some of these gluons are so soft that when they actually appear in the detector, they'll turn into one or two pions or something like that. Just a little bit of extra energy, very low momentum, uh, very low transverse momentum, not a big deal, a contribution to the underlying event. But especially this last one, which got emitted in the shortest time close to the collision, and may have, therefore, the largest amount of energy, that may actually be a visible jet. That may be what we might call you know, an initial state jet, such as I was drawing yesterday on the board, where coiling gets to Higgs, for example. And of course, there's a continuum between these things. There's, not, there's no unique distinction. So the question of what you consider an initial state jet and what's part of the underlying event, well, th this is dependent on how you measure, you know, what cutoff you put on what you define as a jet and exactly how you make the measurements and so forth. So it's all got to be considered part of the initial state radiation. And even that's not entirely defined because, of course, initial and final state radiation actually interfere. So you've got to be a little careful about these notions and how well defined they are. But nonetheless, this is the term that is used for all of this stuff. Now, the point here is that when this gluon is emitted, the quark may have had some fraction of the proton's energy x just before. Now it has a smaller fraction. So the thing that actually does the collision has a probability distribution, which is not really the same as the probability distribution for just sort of abstractly thinking about the quarks in a proton. And it depends on how energetic the collision was because how energetic the collision was determines how many or what, what types of, of these gluons, how off-shell they can be, can actually be emitted. A lower energy process will not have such high energy gluons emitted. A higher energy process will have more gluons emitted. And that's an effect we have to account for. So the part and distribution functions are really not f of x. They're f of x and, well, here what I've called the square root of s. And usually we square that. Right? And people usually call this q squared, which is why uh, I was originally using q squared in the notes. And, okay. Now, really what they're a function of, if you're careful, but I will not be careful here, is the factorization scale. Because really what's important is not so much the momentum of this uh, particular collision, but it's a decision that we make, just as in renormalization we make a decision. What are we going to consider part of the Feynman diagram of this process here? And what are we going to consider part of what's going on inside the proton? That's a division we can make anywhere along this line. And so if we choose to make the division here, we will treat this gluon as part of the Feynman diagram, but this gluon as something we absorb into the parton distribution function. And that scale, mu f, just has to be chosen small enough compared to root s, comparable to. Uh, not too, not too large, and definitely not larger than 
Is the concept clear? It's not really described this way in Peskin and Schroeder, but it's the same thing. OK, good. So then we just have to review the mathematics in Peskin and Schroeder and remind ourselves the important parts in it. All right, let's do that. I'll just take a few minutes, unless you have lots of questions, which will be fine um, if you do. So stop me if I'm going too fast. <coughs> so again, we're imagining this as being a little piece of that, where the particle before the emission is only a little bit off shell, and the particle after the emission, the one that's going to eventually end up in the collision, is now more off shell. And the thing it's emitted is basically on shell. So as I said, p squared and k squared are on shell almost, and q squared is more off shell. So q squared is approximately minus 2p dot k. And this thing is, par is a propagator that's eventually going to be part of something else, part of this scattering amplitude, and maybe have more emissions and so forth. But the important thing is it's going to scatter with something. So this propagator is going to appear in the calculation. So we're going to have a 1 over q squared contribution to anything we calculate. Now, what is that 1 over q squared? It's got the 1 over 2p dot k. Well, a moment's thought will convince you that the energy of the initial quark comes in, the energy of the gluon comes in, and 1 minus cosine theta, where theta is the angle at which the gluon is emitted. And you notice it has two singularities. The singularities are, of course, where this quark actually isn't off shell. And that can occur if the gluon is very, very soft, has very low energy. Obviously, then you know, it remains on, the quark remains on shell. Or, because these are massless particles, if, they're emitted, if the gluon is emitted in the same direction, if theta glue goes to 0, then the quark just gets its momentum rescaled and remains on shell. Okay. So the dominant types of emission are soft emission, where the, f the f quark basically doesn't lose any energy, and z is basically 1, just a little bit less. Or collinear emission, where z could be anything but theta gluon has gone to 0. Right. Collinear and soft emission are the basic singularities. Now, um, the question is, what is the question we want to ask is, what is the amplitude for this process? What is the matrix element um, for this quark to emit that gluon? And of course, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to figure that out, and then of course, integrate, or in some way, exponentiate, or wh whatever is the right way to say it, that effect all the way along this line, since it can happen again and again. And that's what the uh, altarelli prezi or DGLAP equations are doing, is accounting for that process again and again. Now, uh, the equations for fermions emitting gluons are slightly more complicated than those for scalars, and the basic physics is contained in the scalar amplitude. So let me work out just the case of the scalar. So let's put a scalar quark here instead. And then the matrix element for this emission is just the polarization of the gluon dotted into the sum of the momenta p plus q divided by the q squared for this um, propagator. And then everything else I'm just lumping into the amplitude a over here. That's the amplitude for the whole scattering process. Everything else that's coming in, everything else that's going out. Right, so this matrix element has this form. Now what about the square of the matrix element? Because that's, of course, what we're going to need. Um, Oh, by the way, let me first, and I'm not going to keep track of twos here. Uh, well, I guess I will here. Let me write that as epsilon dot p over p dot k. I won't keep track of minus signs because we're going to square this in a moment anyway. Uh, all I did here was use the fact that epsilon dot k is 0, so epsilon dot q is the same as epsilon dot p, and q squared is minus 2p dot k, and divide, factor that the twos. OK, so we square this. And we use the fact that, uh, uh, now, now, OK, so when we square this, we're going to have to sum over polarization vectors and so forth. And now there's a question. What gauge should we use for this calculation? Now, here's a subtlety. Um, of course, the answer is going to be gauge invariant. But when you think about it, this is not the only diagram, right? There's lots of diagrams, which I should really account for. And I have to work them out and make they, they interfere with each other and so forth. Experience shows that if you work in light cone gauge, this is the only diagram which contributes to the singularities. So this is a convenient gauge. Of course, it gives a gauge invariant answer. But it, this is the best gauge to work in for this calculation. So I'm pulling a sleight of hand here. But it's justified because of the gauge I'm working in. And in this gauge, when I make the sum over helicities for the, for the gluon, 
um, this comes uh, to be minus g mu nu plus um, nk plus kn mu nu mu nu over n dot k, where n is a light-like vector that I've chosen for my light chrome gauge. n dot the gauge field is 0 in this gauge. And having done that, um, and in particular, I'm going to choose this gauge since, we'll, since this is the natural direction of the beam pipe, I will cho choose this for n, pointing the other direction in the beam. And then when I square the amplitude, I get, um, and I leave this as an exercise, k dot p, n dot p, over n dot k, p dot k squared. And the interesting thing is that that is proportional to 1 over p dot k again. So the square, this is the important point. The square of the amplitude has the same singularities as the, as the amplitude itself. They're both proportional to 1 over p dot k. That's the only thing that's not obvious, and that's the reason I went through it, because you wouldn't believe me if I didn't do it. OK, so the real amplitude, it's, the amplitude squared has the same collinear and, 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 uh, and uh, soft singularities. And what I've just said here is true for a spin a half quarks. It's true for spin one gauge bosons. It's just true. And it's really because you know, emission of gauge bosons is universal. Now, from the point of view of the quark, this will not be true from the point of view of the emitted gluon. But from the point of view of the quark, the soft singularity basically does something unobservable. It kicks off some very soft thing, and the quark basically doesn't change its momentum. But the collinear singularity does something that is observable, because the quark momentum can change by a substantial fraction. So I'm going to focus on the collinear singularity for that reason. Since it's the quark we're interested in, it's the quark that's going to do the scattering. That won't be true necessarily later on. But for now, I want to focus on the quark. So uh, there's a couple of formulas written in the notes, which you can verify that in the limit that the angle is small, basically k is approximately 1 minus z, because that's the fraction of the energy it carries, times the quarks. Sorry, there's an x0, which I did I define? Yeah, sorry, this should be x0. And this should be x0. So the gluon carries 1 minus c times the quark's initial energy fraction times the beam energy times 1 uh, theta, 0, 1. And q squared uh, again, with a little bit of algebra, well, it's written up there. It's e naught e gluon times 1 minus cos theta, which is basically theta squared for the gluon. And that is 1 minus z x naught squared theta squared. Now, that's the square of the amplitude. There's some kinematics. Now we have to do a phase space integral. And here's where the interesting thing happens. Because the phase space integral involves somewhere along the way, an integral d cos theta of this 1 over p dot k. And the 1 over p dot k is 1 minus cos theta. Or in other words, what we've got is something which is approximately uh, d theta squared over theta squared, um, which also is the same as d q squared over q squared. And that is log divergent at small theta, or small q, small q squared. Now, what that means is, although we might have thought naively that emitting a gluon would cost us an alpha s, there's a logarithmic enhancement that cancels off the alpha s. So in fact, this process is order 1 if the angle is small enough. And therefore, it's not enough to calculate the first diagram. You have to calculate them all. We have to resum this process. Standard sort of renormalization issue. It's exactly the same reason why we have to resum the effects of the beta function. And there's an RG equation for that, and there's an alterelli parisi equation for this, which is sort of similar. OK, so what we're going to do, and again, this is all stuff you know, but hopefully this is said in a way which is uh, insightful. Yeah? 
can't hear you. But how can you justify you can still uh, use the perceptive test test if, the if the gluon momentum is too small? I am assuming here that I'm working in a regime where, I, where the gluons are not that small. So you're right. That's a good question. Uh, there are non-perturbative effects that I'm not accounting for here. But the assumption here is I'm working in a regime which is perturbative. And of course, if the energy of the process is high enough, then at least for some part of the diagram that I just erased, that's true. Well, in, well, the right statement is that when we set up the equation, which we're going to do in a moment, we're going to be calculating what happens when we start with f of x and q squared at one energy, and we move q squared up. So we're already starting at a place where the theory is perturbative. I'm going to move up just a little bit, and that part of the calculation is perturbative. The question was really, well, where do I start? And the answer is we start with a measurement. So we start by measuring this f of x and q squared at some, or f of x and mu squared, really, at some scale. And then we use the equations I'm about to write down to see how it changes. That's the standard, standard way to go. OK, so, so what we're looking for is to t start with something we might know. Well, sorry, we want to find something we don't know. Let's start with that. So we want to know, the, let's say, the up quark distribution at a fixed x and at a particular value of q squared. And that will be its value at an earlier value of q squared plus some sort of convolution integral. And the integral will be what? Well, I'm interested in finding what a quark which, after the emission, has a fraction x. But that x is something smaller than x0. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate over all quarks that have a larger x0. So I'm integrating from x to 1. That's all the quarks that started with a larger fraction. And now I need to take the probability of finding a quark with that x0 fraction at the scale q1 squared and multiply by some sort of Green's function, which says that I start with x and q1. And I, sorry, I start with, uh, yeah, I start with x0 and q1, and I end up with x and q2. Maybe the order of uh, the indices here, or the order of the uh, variables wasn't so smart, but anyway, that's what I've got. So this is the probability for an up quark of virtuality q1 squared and energy fraction x0 to end up with an energy fraction x and virtuality q2 squared. q2 squared higher than q1 squared. OK, and what is that Green's function? Well, that's essentially what we've set up to. Uh, well, let's write it down and, and then interpret it. So that will be some integral from q1 squared up to q2 squared to q squared. And then we'll have an integral over this variable z, which just is the ratio between x0 and x. And that ratio, of course, can go from 0 to 1. <coughs> and then we'll have the probability that if we start with a quark, and it breaks up into a quark that, that we care about and a gluon that we don't. And this is important to keep track of. Okay? That that probability, which is a function in principle of x0 and x, and z, and q squared. And then we have one condition we have to impose, which is that what we mean by x and z uh, is that they're related by this relation. Okay, so this is the probability, differential probability for a quark of virtuality q1 squared to emit a, gluon, emit a gluon such that its fraction x, sorry, fraction x0 drops down to x with this definition of z. Now, of course, I could have written it by doing the delta function, but keeping the delta function is useful. Okay? Any questions? Good. Um, and I called this P tilde for reasons that I even forget, but I'm sure it's going to become clear in a moment. Yeah, OK. So um, now P tilde is what? Well, it's a probability. And it's given by some graph like this. We're going to calculate it. Or it can be calculated. We won't do it. But the important thing is it's scale invariant. 
or at least has to scale properly according to some dimensional analysis. Right? We'll get the dimensional analysis right in a second. Except for possibly the running of alpha s itself. In fact, there should be an alpha s in there. So what is this p tilde going to look like? Well, it's got to be, it's got to have an alpha s of q squared. Because it should be 0 if alpha s is 0. And actually, it's not quite scale invariant. There is this q squared because that's from that propagator. And then some function, which I'll call p, which doesn't depend on alpha s or q squared. It only depends on the fractions, x, x0, and z. In other words, that accounts for the fact that this is really scale invariant. The q squared is accounted for the, scale inv- for the scaling. Alpha s of q squared is an additional effect that just comes from the vertex. And then this function has to be a function of these three variables. But on the other hand, x naught has to do with the fraction of energy that the quark carries inside the proton. Nothing in this calculation knows about the proton. So it can't depend on x, x naught, and z separately. It can only depend on the ratio of x and x naught, in other words, on z. So this whole thing is actually just a function of one variable. And of course, if you do the calculation, that's what you find. But you could have guessed that. Okay, So that means that we can finally substituting that in, and then um, just changing the variable in the delta function to delta of z minus uh, x over x naught, and accounting for the Jacobian for that transformation, what we get is that g is equal to alpha s over 2 pi. Now someone actually has to do the calculation to get to see there's a 2 pi write things in terms of d of log q squared, log q squared because we had dq squared from uh, the initial integral and a 1 over q squared from p tilde. And the upper variable is q2 squared over q1 squared. And then we'll write our integral in terms of dz from 0 to 1. There's a 1 over x0, which comes from the Jacobian. And finally, there's this function of z. And I'm going to uh, just define a notation in a second. I'll call this QQ. Now, notation is important here. Here I was very explicit. This is the probability that a quark splits to a quark and a gluon. The order matters. All right, when I write quark, quark, when I write two letters, this is the probability that the, let's get it straight that we find the first particle after the splitting of the second in that order. So that'll be important in a second. Here, if a quark goes to quark, it doesn't matter. When you have a quark splitting to a gluon or a gluon splitting to a quark, you've got to keep track of which is which. Is there a? Is there a? No, I've taken the arrow out. That's, that was why I, that's why I wanted to, I should just write it here. This is by definition. Normally, when you see it in the literature, the arrow doesn't appear. Peskin and Schroeder are careful to avoid this confusion by putting the arrow in. That's why, that's what, and I did that same thing that way. But in the literature, you won't find it. So you've got to be sure about which which is which. And so finally, we have f of x and q squared, q2 squared, is, um, well, I won't write it out. Let me just write the differential form. The integral form is on your is on your notes. The differential form now is very simple: alpha s over two pi um, integral x to one dx naught over x naught p q q x over x naught f of u at x and q squared. And now we have a nice differential equation that doesn't care what our initial condition was, and we have something we can work with. Now, this is not the complete story, however. This says, how do we get an up quark? 
Did I call it up or just Q? Up, yeah, really an up quark. One way we can get an up quark is that an up quark can split into an up quark and a gluon. And of course, the splitting function, sorry, 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 sorry. The splitting function doesn't depend on whether it's an up quark or down quark or strange quark. So I just wrote PQQ because of course it's universal, it doesn't depend on quark flavor. But this is not the only way we can get a quark. We could also have started with a gluon. The gluon could have split into a quark and an antiquark. So we have to keep track of that too. It could be that the quark that undergoes the collision actually came from a gluon upstream. So we, didn't, we need another term. And here's where the order matters. We need another term, which is P, the probability to find a quark in the splitting of a gluon, P Q glu, x over x naught F glu of x and Q squared. OK, and that's the equation for FU. And there are similar equations for all the other part and distribution functions. And now these functions, PQQ, PQ glu, P glu Q, P glu glu, they can all be calculated. And I'm not going to write them down in their entirety, but I'm going to write down two very important things about them. So here's PQQ. It's some function of z, which you can look up, divided by 1 minus z. And the probability of finding a gluon inside a quark is some other function divided by z. And the probability of finding a quark inside a gluon is some third function um, divided by uh, nothing. It's just, an, uh, actually, I called it h5 of z. So I'm a bit out of order. It's just some function of z. It doesn't have any singularities. And then the probability of finding uh, a gluon inside a gluon has to be symmetric, and z goes to 1 minus z, because obviously there are two ways to find a gluon. You look at the gluon up top, or you look at the gluon on the bottom. So there is a function h3 of z over z, and there's a function h4 of z over 1 minus z. And all these functions, h, are just polynomials, quadratic polynomials. You can calculate them. I don't care about them. The really important thing is the singularity structure. In particular, by the way, there's a mistake in the notes, if you notice. Um, uh, well, you'll see it in a second. The important thing is this. The probability of emitting a gluon in the collinear direction that carries a rather small fraction of either the quark that emitted it or the gluon that emitted it is diverging at small z. In other words, that's the soft singularity showing up as part of the collinear singularity. And that means that the most likely thing to happen as the part and distribution functions evolve is they emit a relatively soft gluon along the collinear direction, which then in turn emits another soft gluon in the collinear direction, which then in turn emits another soft gluon. OK, now everyone know why the part and distribution functions look like this? Okay, that's the explanation. It's because quarks emit soft gluons, gluons emit soft gluons, all the soft gluons. And, and, and there, but there are enough of them heading in the collinear direction that at small x, all you have is tons and tons and tons of soft gluons, which occasionally split to make quark-antiquark -quark pairs, which are sitting down here. It's a completely universal property of gluon emission, because all the gluon emissions have a 1 over z in them. Whereas quark goes, sorry, gluon goes to quark antiquark has no such singularity at small z. So there is no extra population of quark and antiquark pairs down here, except those that come from the gluon splitting directly. But it's easy to make lots and lots of soft gluons. Yeah? Is there, there, some massless quarks that there are massless quarks. This is the, all, all been calculated from massless quarks. I never use the fact that the quark had a mass. And it's not. Yeah. It has to do with the fact that gluons make long range fields. The gluons are spin one, and gauge fields have very special properties. Gravitons would also have similar properties. They're the only fields that do. Yeah. Uh, yes, indeed. H3 and H4 related by z goes to 1 minus z. Yeah. Yeah, the, the symmetry is there. And in fact, there's even a relation. PQQ and PGLUQ are related because it's really the same diagram. The probability of finding a, gluon inside a, a quark inside a quark and a probability of finding a gluon inside a quark are both calculated from that diagram. So they have to be related somehow. Okay, any more questions? Yeah. Well, it does. Z goes to 1 is the, sort of the, the, the mirror image uh, that's essentially what I just said. The probability of emitting a gluon at very 
that a very small fraction is diverging. And therefore, the probability of finding a quark, which has just lost a tiny fraction of its energy, is also diverging. They're just mirror images of each other. But of course, at z near 1, you're not changing the parton distribution very much. The point is you're populating the parton distribution functions with lots of soft gluons, and that's changing them. So what's happening is all the quarks are gradually losing energy and dumping them into gluons down here, which in turn are losing energy and dumping them into more gluons even further down. And you can see this is completely universal. It doesn't matter what type of hadron you're talking about. Okay, this would be true for any hadron. Doesn't, the details of what hadron you're talking about sit up here, but the low energy PDFs are always the same. Low X PDFs, yeah. With BFKL, uh, let me not do that here. Let, let me not do that here. It's a, it's a long story. I'd be happy to talk to you about that outside of this context. But I, I don't want to get diverted on it, and it's a long story. Okay. So the summary is: everybody, all the particles for emitting other particles have a collinear singularity. There's always a tendency for the particles to emit along the direction of motion. And that is what makes the parton distribution of functions change. Only the gluons have a soft singularity, however, so they have a dominant effect, especially at small x. And they make everything else move down. Right? As you move up in q squared, you have this emission. Everything loses energy. It's, always, it's, it's not reversible. Nothing gains energy through emission. Um, and I should add, <coughs> you might wonder, well, you know, there are three, at least three types of light quarks. Maybe you should even consider the charm in bottom two. So even though you know, there isn't a singularity, there is an NF for, for, for quark-antiquark -quark emission. So is, isn't that important? The answer is, yeah, well, it's a little important. It's a factor of five. But you know, the factor here is getting up towards you know, 100. So it's not, it's not big enough to make a difference. Gluons really dominate at low x. Now, one other thing I should add is that um, and it's related to something I said last time, and it's not in the notes, but I should have, I should have put it in the notes. Um, you notice that the, 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 the degree to which these things run, the rate at which they change, is proportional to alpha s. So the higher I go in energy, the less they run. And of course, that's part of why Bjorkian scaling worked. The, the whole idea that the parton model could work at all is the statement that these things don't run very fast. They have an alpha s in front of them. So the higher energy you go, the more Burkane scaling is actually correct. Of course, secretly, there's an NC over 3 here. There has to be, right? It's perturbation theory. We did a calculation of perturbation theory. It's an expansion of the Etoffe coupling. So there has to be an NC, which tells you that if we went to a theory that had large Etoffe coupling, as we sort of approached from small Etoffe coupling, as we sort of imagine a theory that has a fixed coupling, for example, a conformal field theory has a fixed coupling, we sort of consider a family of conformal field theories with larger and larger coupling. Well, we consider this in n equals 4 Yang Mills. I could do this in n equals 4 Yang Mills, for example. I have not use confinement anywhere. I can do these calculations in n equals 4 Yang Mills just fine. The larger the coupling constant becomes, the faster the emission becomes. The faster it is that these PDFs evolve. And in fact, when you go to the larger Etoffe coupling regime, what do you find? The PDFs don't look like this. They look like this. The evolution is so fast, there's basically nothing hard. There's, there are no high x partons in a hadron at large Tuff coupling, because the evolution is so quick. And you can sort of see, you can see that's setting in. Right? It's, it's sort of there in the perturbative equation. You don't really know what's going to happen to a large Tuff coupling until you calculate an ADS CFT. But it's not surprising that the evolution becomes very rapid and that there's not much left after a little bit of evolution. The partons are all very soft. And also, there's another way of thinking about that, which is that hadrons in ADS-CFT are strings. And there's nothing hard inside a string. It's just a bunch of soft stuff glued together. So any questions? The question is, how do you interpret F in a conformal field theory? So what you would do is you would take a theory that's conformal to high energies and either imagine, because of course this calculation doesn't require it, you would either imagine doing it or you would actually take a theory where this is actually the case. You break the conformal invariance at some scale 
and the confinement sets in very quickly thereafter. And, it's, and the larger the atuf coupling, the faster it sets in. So there's not much separation. Of, there's not much, there's not, if you do that, you have a conformal filter here, and then there's a small region where it's not quite conformal. And then you have confinement right away. So you can set up that problem. Uh, you, can, well, you, you can set it up both ways. You can do both cases. I mean, that, that is say you, in, in fact, the calculation was done using such a theory. Uh, famous examples of the n equals one star theory that Joe Kultensky and I worked out. The model, the, the um, well, let me just leave it at that. Um, but the point is, the calculation doesn't really require a specific metric. It, it requires qualitative features, not, not, not very quantitative ones, to see why this happened. Um, it's very, very much physics intuition, not detailed metric that matters. Um, one other thing I should emphasize, I mean, you know, and it's, it's connected with this question, is that what you're learning from the fact that, you know, the coupling constant doesn't really run very much once you're up at, at 100 GV, and the part and distribution functions don't run very much, or they run, in, at least the, the, the way they run is sort of controlled in a simple way. Um, the difference between QCD and a conformal field theory when alpha s is a tenth is not very much. The differences are important in some contexts, but it is important to keep in mind that conformal word identities are not violated by a lot. They're violated by the running of alpha s, which is not order alpha s, it's order alpha s squared. And that's actually useful for many calculations and also for comparing something like n equals four Young Mills calculations to QCD. Some of them actually match pretty well to the order that they should. And the point is that there, there is actually some insight to be gained by comparing them. Uh, qualitatively, not quantitatively, of course. Okay, any questions about part on distribution functions? Because now we move to jets. Okay, let's move to jets. So in a jet calculation, we're gonna take a very similar physical process, except that we're gonna look at a quark coming out or a gluon coming out in the final state. And the difference is very simple at first, at first light, although there'll be a complication we'll deal with in a second. The difference is that in the case of an initial state quark, we started with an on-shell quark, and we ended up with something that became increasingly off-shell before it entered the collision. When you draw a Feynman diagram, glue glue goes to glue glue, you're thinking in your head, okay, these two gluons are on-shell, these two gluons are on-shell, this gluon is off-shell. Of course, that's not what really happens. If the energy of that collision is 200 GeV, it's not gonna surprise you if this gluon is off-shell by, let's say, 20 GeV. Why should it be on shell? It's just on shell enough that you're not really worrying about the fact that it's off shell, but it's a little off shell. So a particle coming out of some interaction is a little bit off shell, and eventually it's gonna turn into on shell things, quarks and gluons, and it does so via this shower that I've drawn here. You start with something off shell and it emits just the way that thing emits, except that the difference is what I drew above P was essentially on shell, K was essentially on shell, and Q was off shell. Now it's the reverse. P is off shell, and K and Q are much more on shell. Other than that, everything is the same. The calculations are the same. The matrix element is the same. The splitting functions are the same. You just have to keep track of the kinematics so that the interpretation is right. The math is basically the same. At least at, 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 at this order. I should at least emphasize when you go to higher orders, there are subtleties which show up in the jets that don't show up in the, in the jet formation that don't show up in the part and distribution functions. And I can't explain that to you because I don't entirely understand it myself. But it's, it's there. Yeah. I, I would mean what, the next loop. So you start to account for, for yeah, I, by high, thank you for the question. I mean one loop corrections to this. Everything here I'm doing is tree level, although it's in an infinite order uh, in alpha s. But it, it, it's, it's um, infinite order in alpha s times log. But then they order alpha s with no log, corrections to that. And those involve differences. There, there are some differences between the two cases. OK, so let's see. So we have a quark that's coming out of some collision. And it's off shell by an amount q squared. Um, the scattering, ah, here would have been better notation. The scattering occurs at q naught squared. Why didn't I think of that? OK, the scattering occurs at q naught squared far above lambda squared. The quark comes out with a virtuality q squared, which is less than q naught squared, and now it starts evolving, essentially using the same equations backwards. The difference is, well, it's not really such a big difference, but it is a difference in the following sense. When I did the calculation, I really, before, I focused on the quark. 
because the quark was going to do the scattering. And then I said, well, you know, there's these other glu these gluons that got radiated off. And they turn into initial state radiation and maybe even a jet. So we want to keep track of them. But they're traveling more or less along the beam pipe, most of them. So they're not things we measure very carefully. This quark is coming out at an angle to the beam pipe. And all of the radiation it emits is going to go into the detector. So we have to keep track of it much more carefully in this case. Is that clear? We're going to measure all this stuff. It's all going to be part of what we call a jet. In fact, it is what we call a jet. What is a jet? A jet is the fact that you start with an, an off-shell quark after a collision, and it starts emitting. And the emitters emit and emit and emit. And some things go out the side that are kind of soft, but a lot of the stuff is pretty collinear, because the same collinear singularity is there. So there's soft stuff which is soft, but it's soft. We don't care about it. And the stuff which isn't soft is collinear, and it makes a blob of quarks and gluons all heading in the same direction. Not a single quark anymore, but the quark was off shell anyway. It makes something which has non-zero mass, because its mass is equal to this off shell and this q squared. And its form momentum is pretty much the form momentum of this quark. Taken as an ensemble of particles. So we start with what is known as a hard off-shell parton. And we're ending up with softer, not soft, but softer, collinear partons, plural, in a shower. All calculable, on average, using the types of equations we just used for the PDFs. So there's a subtlety with that statement. I'll come back to it. Basically, it's true. And then when hadronization occurs, what happens? We apply parton-hadron duality. Not to this parton, but to all of these. So the shape of a jet, where the hadrons go, whether you get two jets or one, how wide the jet is, all those little properties that you have to measure from the hadrons are calculable from these partons using the QCD calculation of the shower. And that's why we can predict so much of what jets do. It's, because, it's not because jets come from hadronization, which is what you usually hear people say. It's because hadronization doesn't matter. And because the part that does matter is calculable. It's the shower which makes the jet, not the hadronization. The hadronization just spruces it up a little bit. Any questions? Yes? So you said the duality is between the softer collision partons and the hadrons. The softer collinear part, collinear. Yeah, collinear. And you also said that the softer collinear partons conserve the mass and the original form momentum of that part. That is correct. So it is true. It would also be true for the, the eventual hadrons. For the momentum, yes, except that we have to account now for the fact that this jet has a shape. And we're going to apply an algorithm to define what this jet means. And in doing so, we won't probably collect all of the momentum. And we might collect some extra stuff from, around, from, from other places. This might make a jet or jets, depending on the algorithm we use. But that's calculable. So the statement is, when you apply the jet algorithm to these particles, the soft partons at the end of the shower, and you apply them to the hadrons, you will get basically the same result. But it may not be the same result as applying it to this guy. Because this fractal process of emission by emission by emission has a shape. It's a tree structure. And sometimes there are branches that go off to the side and give two jets, not one, for this hard part on. OK? Yes? So, OK, are you, is parton hadron duality, is that something that's a precise definition? That appears no. In no, it's a slogan. It's a slogan which says that if you, it's something which you, let's say it's a hypothesis. The hypothesis is that the momentum distribution of the partons 
and the momentum distribution of hadrons differs by amounts which become increasingly small as you go to higher energy. How to make that precise, I'm actually not sure myself. Okay, but there, there's some, there's some, you know, you would like to say that the difference becomes smaller as you go up in energy. Then you have to test that in data. And you do that, and it works. So in the end, it's justified by the data. We don't know why parton hadron duality works in QCD, although, as I argued to, we do know that it doesn't work in some theories on basic theoretical grounds. It's, it's different from factorization. Factorization is a nice perturbative separation between some, sorry, a nice separation between the non-perturbative physics at low energy and the perturbative physics at high energy, but in the perturbative regime. Factorization here would be putting a cut at this point, where there's still perturbative stuff going on. And it would tell you how do you, how does the parton shower evolve in the perturbative regime? But the hadronization involves how, how does the how does the perturbative shower evolve in the non-perturbative regime? And we have no calculational technique for that. In other words, if you move the factorization scale down to the one to the one GV scale and below, we lose control. In principle, it's the same idea, but in practice, you can't use it. Yes. It works because QCD is not conformal. Not conformal. It works because QCD is not conformal. Um, is a soft I disagree with that statement, but I don't want to get into it right now. Okay. Uh, I, OK. Um, and and the, reason, the reason I disagree is because if QCD, um, when QCD is conformal, uh, which it can be, um, if, for example, if you take n equals 4 Yang Mills, factorization works just fine. Duality. Oh, part on how to duality. No, I, I dis and I disagree with that also. I gave a strong argument last time that what it has to do with is the fact that NF over NC is order 1. That's a sufficient, although not, I mean, sorry, that's a, a necessary but not sufficient condition. There may be other reasons. And you need light quarks. NF light is over NC is, is, is more to one. That's what I, yeah. Um, OK, now, there's another key. Let's see how am I doing in time. I guess I'm doing all right. Um, there's another key point, which is that we need to actually be able to calculate this somehow. And this doesn't look like a very easy thing to calculate if what you're trying to calculate is not, let's say, the average number of particles here, but the actual shapes of jets and their distribution of those shapes. How are you going to do that? I mean, it's a pretty complicated set of equations to sort of resum and keep track of everything as opposed to keeping track of one particle at a time, which is what we did in the part of distribution functions. Now we have to keep track of everybody to get the jet shape and whether there are two jets or one. So there's a key fact, which is that it is possible to take these equations and show that you can model this process as a classical branching process and put it on a computer. And that is a non-trivial result on which Pythia and Herwig and Sherpa's model of this shower critically depends. And so it's another thing which you might just take for granted that you shouldn't. And I'm not going to describe it, but you can look it up in um, the appropriate QCD textbooks. And I'll mention one at the end. that you can model it in a way that interference doesn't come in. But it's not obvious. I mean, just stare at the graphs. How do you know that? OK, well, somebody has to think about it. So a very important QCD result, I think, from the, from the early 80s, maybe late 70s. Um, now, of course, we'd love to extend this. This is all tree level. We'd love to extend it to higher orders, because those higher orders might matter. And that's an active research area. And it's not at all obvious how that's going to work itself out. OK. Now, there's one th other thing you should worry about, which is that I said you don't have to worry about this soft emission. But quantitatively, if you look at how much soft emission comes out and you're naive, you find it's too much. In fact, it would kind of destroy the jet structure. There is a lot of soft emission, at least in these equations. But there's another fact which preserves the jet structure, which is that the, uh, the soft emission has some correlations in it. And those correlations are quantum mechanical. And another miracle is that that can also be treated classically. So how does this work? And this ties in again with string theory. So let's say I have a quark that's moving along, and it emits a gluon. Let me draw things in Etoff's double line notation. Can anyone cover Etoff's double line notation? 
So you have a quark with color C, uh, one, and now it emits a gluon with color C1 and C2 bar, and then you have a quark with color C2. Now, suppose that, in some, suppose that one of these two particles wants to emit a gluon off the C2 color line. OK, fine. So we can emit again. Let's put it off the gluon for fun. OK, so now we have C2 bar here, and we have C3 and C, sorry, C3 bar and C3 going up here. Okay. Now, this is true if I only consider the planar graph. But since we're dominated by gluon emission, it might not surprise you that the planar graphs are pretty good approximation to the truth, because you know the non-planar graphs are down by 1 over nc squared, which is a 10. So to the 10% level, I can just talk about planar graphs. Let's do that. Now here's a fascinating thing. When this gluon gets emitted, where does it go? Supposing it's soft, it's low energy. That's fine. Okay, so, so let's imagine, in fact, that it's very low energy compared to the particles it's being emitted from. Where does it go? Anywhere? Well, let's ask the same question. If I had an electron and a positron, and they emit a soft photon, where does it go? Anywhere? So imagine I have an electron positron. Here they are. Okay, they're heading this way. Here goes an electron positron pair. They're slowly moving apart. Where might they radiate? And where won't they radiate? So one of you who's sitting out there, any one of you, can you tell that there's an electron positron pair here? Why not? What, what makes it hard? What are you feeling out there in the wilderness? You're feeling a dipole field. It's kind of low, right? There's a probability that the electron radiates towards you, and there's a probability that the, prob that the actually there's a probability the amplitude that the electron emits towards you, and there's a probability the amplitude that the positron emits towards you. And guess what? They have opposite signs, of course, because if I took the electron and positron and put them right together, you would see nothing. In other words, if I have an electron and positron, they're doing this. Where are they going to radiate? Mostly in between. A little bit outside, but mostly out here, and not out in this direction. So not only is this gluon emitted in between the quark and the antiquark in the sense of the double line notation, where this is sort of forming an abstract plane, but it's also emitted between the quark and the gluon in physical space. And that means that the soft radiation tends to be inside the jets and not so much outside the jets, and preserves the jet structure. It's color correlations that make this happen. So we're dominated in the parton shower by gluon emission, because the gluons have lots and have those singularities, and because gluons emit gluons. There's a few quark and antiquark pairs, but not too many. We're dominated by planar graphs, and it's nice that NC is big. And the, the actual shape of how the color is correlated in physical space has a sort of planar structure. Or better, better said, if I cut through this planar structure at any given time, what does it look like? It looks like a string. Because this gluon tended to emit a gluon sort of over here, which emitted a gluon over here, which emitted a gluon over here, which emitted a gluon over here, which is connected to a quark over there, and an antiquark over there, and a gluon over here. It forms sort of a string in physical space moving outward. And that string is present before hadronization. It's a string of the embedding of the planar graph into physical space, which then makes it easy to understand why, when Pythia tries to model hadronization, it starts with a string. There is a string connecting each gluon to the next in color space. And it actually looks like a sort of windy, wiggly string. Questions? Let me emphasize how interesting this is. I mean, the, the shower, the dominant important thing in the shower is the planar graphs, the large NC limit. The hadronization, the really important thing, is that the quarks are there, that NF over NC is order 1. The quarks don't play such a role in the shower 
because of that one over z singularity, that the gluons are emitted easily and that they emit more gluons. But in the hadronization, it's critical that as the string begins to actually, as the flux tube begins to form, it breaks immediately, letting all that momentum flow right through. There are little wiggles on the string. Right? Think about it. Here I've got a, so what I'm telling you is I've got a gluon. So look at this, look at this, uh, let me draw a couple more lines on this. All right? So let's, let's put um, another one here. Okay, there's a piece of string here if I cut this graph at a particular time. Right? This quark is an end of a string, and then it's connected to this string bit, and it's connected to that string bit, which is connected to that string bit. And again, they're correlated in space as well as in this abstract plane that I've written here. And the fact that they're correlated in space means there really is something physical that can be, I mean, it's imaginary, but nonetheless, it's sort of semi-physical. It can be thought about as connecting one gluon to the next. As opposed to, if, the, if, if, this, if this quark were connected to a gluon going over there, which was connected to a gluon going over there, which was connected going to, to a gluon over there, drawing a string like this wouldn't be actually very useful. But here, they're actually close together in momentum space. And it is useful. Good. Next topic. Any more questions? I won't quite get as far as I'd hoped, but it was worth it, I think. Can you have a gluon whose, whose, whose momentum squared is so small that it's smaller than the mass of the pion? Uh, what would that mean? I mean, gluons, after all, are degrees of freedom that we use for describing the perturbative physics. They don't even exist at low momentum. A gluon is a perturbative object. If you want to try to ask a question that goes in the non-perturbative regime, I don't even know how to formulate the question. All gluons, when you write them down, are just part of a perturbative computation, including all these. I mean, in the end, there isn't actually a gluon state, right? I mean, this, this is part of a calculational technique which in the end produces the physical state. What do you mean if that gluon is too soft? What is a soft gluon? That's soft. Don't forget what quantum field theory is, right? And Nadi's going to tell you about theories where you can, well, you already know about theories, where I can, I can take the gluons of n equals four Yang mills and describe them in terms of some dual gluons. Or I can describe them in terms of a bulk space. I mean, gluons aren't, you know, what's physical about a gluon? If a gluon is an, a high energy object, then it can produce something physical, a jet. And the jet is physical. It's really meaningful. And I can interpret it as coming from a perturbative gluon. But that's an interpretation. If you ask me about a gluon in a regime where gluons don't make any sense, I can't answer the question. Gluons at extremely low momentum, strongly interacting things, and they, they don't, they don't, at some point they don't mean anything. It's just part of a technical calculation. Um, the soft collinear effective theory is um, a method for doing th these types of calculations that relies very strongly on the fact that you can s that you can that you have a perturbative theory and um, a good alpha s expansion. I am not. I I believe. I mean, there, the fact that the soft collinear theory expansion works is, is correlated with the fact that um, the atrophic coupling is small. And the fact that there are jets is also something which is true only in, the, uh, in that regime. But to say that the two statements are equivalent is, is not, well, it's not obvious. They have a proof that it works. Uh, yeah, we can discuss that. They have proofs of things. They still don't have a proof of part on how to duality. But I mean, look, this was proven, this stuff was proven long ago. It's not like they have a new proof of anything. This, is, this stuff was proven in the 70s and 80s. All the stuff I just told you about, the, the, the soft gluons going in between here, this was proved in the early 80s um, by great QCDers like Yuri Dokshitzer and uh, Brian Weber and people like that, who you may not even have heard of, but they're very important physicists. The soft collinear theory is you know, 25 years behind in that, in that, in that, for that question. 
Okay, what is the probability that one hard parton will produce two jets? Clearly, it depends on how you define your jets. If my jet is with a radius of 1, the answer is not so big. If my jets have a radius of 0.4, it's fairly large. And that's important. I mean, this is why when you count jets, you have to tell me which algorithm you're using and what settings you're using. The answer of how many jets are in an event is clearly not a well-defined concept. This is a fractal. How many objects are here? I mean, that, it doesn't, counting jets doesn't mean anything. You have to tell me operationally how you counted them. And then I can give you an answer. Although I don't know the number off the top of my head, we can look at plots. Yeah? If you want to go to one loop level, I'm not an expert. I can't, I, I'm almost certain you would, but I don't actually know what people have tried to do. Yes. Um, in fact, um, uh, one of us or both of us are going to talk a little bit about using the fact that we understand the fractal structure of the jet and, and how likely you are, given a jet definition, to see subjects inside the jet. Um, to use that fact to say, well, QCD jets make subjects in this or that way, whereas a Z boson traveling very fast this way will make a quark-anti-quark -quark pair, with, which will therefore look like a single jet with subjects. And those subjects, on average, will look different. So we do use this structure in the calculational, and, 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 and at least at the level of the first branching or maybe the second branching. If, if, so if you think of this as being a tree, the place where the trunk branches in first and maybe the second time, yeah, we do, we do use that. And in particular, the properties of how often it branches and in what way. It is a fictitious scale. The, 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 mu the factorization scale, again, strictly speaking, we're talking about parton distribution functions here, so I don't actually really understand it entirely for jets. But for, for parton distribution functions, it's a well-defined, well-understood thing. That is a choice, just like a normalization scale. So Huxley was using actually a fictitious scale. Absolutely. And indeed, when I, I, in fact, I should have said it. These equations, which I wrote in terms of Q squared, just as for the normalization group, what you really mean when you write an equation like that is I'm going to define the parton distribution functions not with a q squared, but with a mu squared. And of course, there's a relationship, just as in the usual RG, that if I know how the beta function changes, which is something which is defined with respect to our normalization scale, that also tells me how physical quantities will change. Right? The normalization group for, physical, for, the, for Green's functions, things you measure, is related to the normalization group for this fictitious quantity, the coupling. Same thing here. These things, when you really define them properly, they're fictitious, like a coupling constant. They run like a coupling constant. But things you measure will run the same way. OK. Well, uh, I'm 10 minutes behind uh, or so, and uh, somehow I'll make up for that. OK, see you tomorrow.